Hello, welcome to the final set of video notes on topic 8. Here we're looking again at topic 8.3. We'll be getting into the light independent reactions. So of course this is the second half of 8.3. Earlier we talked about the light dependent reactions, about how photolysis is going to take water, end up producing oxygen gas, um, NADPH, and ATP. And now we're going to see how those materials in the stroma of the chloroplast are going to create um, glucose using um, carbon dioxide as a source of carbon and oxygen. So uh, now we'll go through our independent reactions and then photosynthesis will be complete. You have failed me for the last time. So looking at the independent reactions today, they'll be taking place in the stroma. Uh, now that we have the ATP in order to power the independent reactions and we have the NADPH, we'll be looking at how the independent reactions are going to use a special enzyme called Rubisco. And we'll talk about Rubisco using RUBP in order to create uh, glycerate 3 phosphate or G3P and then also triose phosphate or TP, and then eventually that creates a glucose. We'll also talk about how um, RUBP has to be regenerated, uh, which is the whole reason why photosynthesis actually turns out to be a really inefficient process, even though uh, all life is kind of really dependent on photosynthesis in most ecosystems, uh, it's, it's not really a great system. And we're gonna talk about why it's not such a great system. Uh, and again, we'll be reviewing the structure of the chloroplast, just reviewing those key parts and how they're related to the overall process of photosynthesis. And then finally, we'll summarize talking about uh, Calvin. So really the independent reactions, we're talking about the uh, Calvin cycle, and we'll talk about the uh, researcher Calvin and how he determined what was happening in these complex chemical reactions. So for the independent reactions, or also known as the Calvin cycle, we are going to create a glucose phosphate, or basically glucose, which is a six carbon molecule. And once we have those glucose phosphates, we can start combining them together to form starch. And then that can be used as a storage form for energy. It can later be broken down uh, in order to um, power growth and um, cellular respiration. Uh, it can be used to form cellulose, and then that cellulose can be used to form more cell walls. So there's lots of things that can happen once we have these glucose 6 phosphates. So we're going to need to use CO2, specifically 6 CO2. If it's a 6 carbon molecule, right, we're going to need uh, 6 CO2 because there's a single carbon in each one of them, and the ATP and then the NADPH we have from the light dependent reactions, right? So what we're going to do is the Calvin cycle, and you're looking, wow, this is a lot of stuff. It looks like the Krebs cycle, where we're having a whole bunch of reactions coming in and coming out, and ATP is involved, and there's a whole bunch of complicated names for different molecules. And yes, you are going to have to memorize these names and the processes of the Calvin cycle, but we're going to break it down into three specific sections of the Calvin cycle to kind of help you understand, in general, what is happening. So starting with our first section, which we're calling carbon fixation, because what we're doing is fixing carbon to something. Carbon fixation means to add that specific molecule to another molecule. Nitrogen fixation means we're adding nitrogen. Hydrogen fixation would be hydrogen being added to something. So carbon fixation, we're adding a carbon molecule. Specifically, what we're doing is adding the carbon that is in CO2 to a five carbon molecule called RUBP. So RUBP, five carbons. If we add a uh, sixth carbon here, glucose, we get a six carbon molecule, which we then can use to move forward to create uh, the building blocks to create more RUBP to make sure our cycle is continuing. Now this process is going to be catalyzed by Rubisco, and hopefully that sounds familiar because back in topic two when we talked about different specific examples of proteins, we talked about Rubisco. Rubisco is the most abundant protein on earth. It makes up about 50% of the uh, volume or mass of proteins inside of plant cells, and since plants make up the base of all of our ecosystems, uh, we would exp you could say that it is the most common enzyme on earth. So Rubisco, super important enzyme, and what basically what it's doing is powering this reaction, doing a carboxylation, or uh, car sorry, carbox, a carbon fixation, adding the carbon of C, uh, CO2 to the RUBP. Now, when it creates this six carbon molecule, it's not stable. It's not like glucose, which is super stable. It's actually really unstable the way that this molecule is formed. So even though it is a six carbon molecule for a few microseconds, it immediately splits into two three carbon molecules called 
glycerate three phosphates. All right, and so we get two G3Ps. So you can think of it as glycerate three phosphate, or you could shorten it to just G3P, or sometimes you'll see it as just GP as a way of, of shortening it as well. Now, those glycerate three phosphates are a pretty good start for ultimately what we want to get at the end, which is called a triose phosphate, but it's not the right uh, formation. So we need to move forward with the process of the Calvin cycle and change the G3P into a TP or triose phosphate so that it can be used for the next section of the uh, Calvin cycle. So then what we move on to is the next phase, which is G3P is going to be converted into what we call triose phosphate or TP. So here we have the reduction of G3P. So it's going to be reduced. And through this process, we're going to have to use some energy. So ATP from the light dependent reaction is going to have to come in. So two ATP are going to be involved. That produces two ADP, which will go back to the light independent reaction to continue that cycle moving forward. We're also going to use the NADPHs that we got from our light dependent reaction. So specifically two NADPH are going to be donating hydrogens, which end up creating two NADP+, which will go off to the light dependent reaction again to be recycled, right? So they go back to the light dependent reaction. And through this process, you end up with triose phosphate or TP. Now, triose phosphate is one half of glucose phosphate. So if we take triose phosphate and we were to connect them together, right, to form our ring structure here, because glucose is in a ring shape, uh, we would actually have glucose phosphate. We would create the thing that we need as our end product of photosynthesis. However, that would be a big problem. We can't do that because if you remember, one carbon came from um, CO2, but the five other carbons came from another molecule called RUBP. So if we don't replace the RUBP that we started with, right, this molecule that's just produced inside of the chloroplasts, uh, the whole system shuts down. Eventually, if RUBP runs out, then we can't do photosynthesis anymore. So what we need to do is the last part of the, of the Calvin cycle, the light independent reactions, is to regenerate RUBP. So we have to regenerate RUBP by using five out of every six triose phosphates. And so this might be a little complicated to think about. So let's, let's, let's do some mathematics here, right? So if we have, let me get my pen here, uh, RUBP equals five carbons. So if we go through the cycle once, one RUBP, RUBP, that's going to equal five carbons. That's going to be five carbons used, right? We go through this process, we end up with two three carbon molecules, right? Two three carbons here. So we have enough carbons to replace the RUBP, but we would only end up with one carbon left over. And that's not good enough because we don't want one carbon left over. We want enough carbon to make a glucose and that's not gonna be good enough. So that's not gonna work. So we need to go through the cycle again. So then let's say we do two RUBPs, right? So we go through it two times. Well, instead of five carbons now, we've now used 10 carbons, right? But if we go through this process, we now get two times the number of triose phosphates here. So we now have four triose phosphates. So if we say that four times three, that means we have 12 carbons total in terms of the triose phosphates that are produced. So we've used 10, right? And we get 12. Well, we could put 10 back in, right? And that ends up giving us two carbons left over, but that's not enough and really to really make a glucose, right? That's not good enough. So that's not going to work. So then we're going to do it a third time. So we do three cycles through we used three RUBP, we've used 15 carbons, right? 15 carbons, if we have three times the number of triose phosphates, right? So there's three, there's two, three, three, there's two, three carbon molecules. We've done it through three times. That means we should end up with 18 carbons at the end, 
Well, if we subtract the 15 carbons that we need to put back into our UBP, that ends up with three carbons left over. And so this three carbons are left over are actually one triose phosphate. So if we go through the cycle three times, we get, so three times equals one half, one half of a glucose, right? So if we go through this whole process six times, right, we will get one glucose. We'll get two one-halves of a glucose, which gives us a glucose. And that makes a lot of sense, because if we go through the cycle six times, if we're using one carbon dioxide every time we go through the cycle, you already know that photosynthesis's balanced equation says that you need six carbon dioxides. So if one turn of the cycle uses one carbon dioxide, you must go through the cycle six times in order to make a glucose. And if that happens, we end up replacing all of the RUBP that we would have used, right? We, if this would happen, so let me get all this out of here. Say we go through the cycle six times, right? Uh, so we did six RUBPs, right? Out of five, that would have been 30 carbons would have been used, right? But we end up with six times the number of uh, triose phosphates here. All right, so then that's 36 carbons total, we subtract the 30 carbons that we need to go back into our RUBP, and so that leaves six carbons left over, and that's the six carbons that are found inside of glucose. So this is how photosynthesis has to work, and this is why I say that it's an incredibly inefficient system. Imagine if you are a factory worker or some, you know, some type of producer of a product, and you produce six products, and then five of them you're going to take apart and put them back into the system in order to make more product. And only one of them, one out of the six, are you actually going to use in order to you know, make your final product. Really inefficient to do it that way. But the system ultimately does work because you see that photosynthesis is out there you know, being done by all these producers and capturing light energy, changing it into chemical energy. Plants are growing very well, producers grow very well all over the surface of the earth, and whole ecosystems are built on this chemical process. Our food, ultimately our nutrition, is coming from this process. So even though it's not really efficient, life still has adapted very well to using it as a source of chemical energy. So one out of every six is gonna be used, and five out of every six, combining with some ATP from our light-dependent reaction, are going to go back into creating the RUPP. So that means ultimately, if we want to make a glucose, right, we're going to have to go through the whole cycle six times. And that goes very well with our equation, seeing that we need six CO2 in order to make a single glucose. Okay, so then let's test how well you've understood all this process. Why don't you give this a pause and see if you can uh, answer this question. Can you explain how the light independent reactions rely on the light dependent reactions in photosynthesis? Six marks. Yep, so you gave it a shot. Okay, so hopefully you approach this question from the idea of those products and those reactants. How are these all connected to each other based on the products and based on the reactants? Ultimately, the independent reaction is really dependent on light because the stuff from the light dependent reaction are necessary for the independent reaction to occur. So really everything is ultimately based on light. So you could have said things that light causes photoactivation, right, the excitation of these electrons. This ultimately leads to the production of ATP and NADPH, which are products of the light-dependent reaction. The light-dependent reaction are necessary for um, uh, light-independent reaction. So you can also be adding more marks on exactly how ATP and NADPH are going to be produced through these light-dependent reactions. And then you're connecting them into the light independent reactions, the idea that the light independent reactions are gonna be making uh, G3P, which eventually becomes TP or triose phosphate using carbon dioxide. But in for order for this to occur, um, the reduction is going to happen using both NADPH and ATP from the light dependent reactions.
So I'm going to think about this color coding that's happening here. Why am I using very specific colors? Well, it's this idea that it shows it's necessary that you should be able to use specific terms. Or this idea of ATP, where, what is it? Where does it come from? NADPH, what is it? Where does it come from? Uh, when we talk about the reactants and the products of the light dependent reaction, then becoming the light or becoming the reactants for the light independent reaction and the ultimate products of photosynthesis. It's not a, it's not only that you should be able to kind of go through these processes, but you should be able to uh, show how they're connected. So it's not just repeating the steps of the light dependent and independent reaction, but more removing the steps that are maybe not so necessary and focusing on the ones that are just there to show the connections between the reactants and the products. So next, now that we've completed talking about the light dependent and independent reactions, just reviewing again, when we talk about this connection between structure and function, you should be able to explain the relationship between the structure of the, of the chloroplasts and ultimately the function of what the chloroplast is doing. So if we think about um, um, plants, right? So plants have these palisade cells, which are basically the top cells here, right? And we have these palisade cells, we also call them the mesofilled cells. And so these cells are going to have a very high density of chloroplasts, which makes a lot of sense because they're on the top. So if the sun is up here, right, and so rays of sunlight are passing through the plant, right, as light moves through materials, it loses a little bit of energy, you know, like as, wa as light moves through water, eventually it loses so much energy that there will be an area or a depth of the water in which there is no light or the aphotic zone. Right? So the, if you want to capture as much energy as possible from sunlight, you're going to want to have your chloroplasts as close to the source of sun as possible. So here, these upper layer of our leaves are where the palisade or the mesophyll cells are going to be located, which are, have tons of chloroplasts, way more chloroplasts than any other part of the plant. Then if we think about the inside of the chloroplast itself, how is the chloroplast structure related to its function? So we have, again, those thylakoid membranes. Those membranes are going to increase our surface area because that's where the light absorption is going to occur and the light-dependent reactions. So if we want to absorb as much light as possible, we need to not only have a very, very wide area, right, so the very wide section of um, membrane, but because light passes through a membrane, we can fold the membrane back and forth and we can kind of capture that light as it moves from one set of membranes to the next set of membranes. So stacking them in these forms of folded granule actually, grania actually increase the surface area dramatically as this light is passing through the chloroplast, making the efficiency of our photosystems and the um, production of ATP and NADPH uh, a lot higher. All right, so it's just like our mitochondria, increase folds, packing them all together uh, makes more surface area. Also, by having the folded membranes really close to each other, it decreases the size of the gap between the thylakoid membranes. It helps keep that thylakoid space really small, which helps maintain the concentration gradient. And we need to make sure that we have a very high concentration gradient on the inside of the thylakoid space uh, compared to that low concentration on the outside so that we can have very efficient chemiosmosis. Moving of these hydrogen ions from a high concentration down to a low concentration down that gradient through ATP synthase in order to generate ATP. And then finally in the stroma, stroma is relatively large and open compared to other parts of the chloroplast, right? There's a lot of space for enzymes and all these different reactants to be bumping into each other, going through the chemical process of the Calvin cycle, uh, ultimately creating our, um, our uh, glucose as our final product. So if we think about chloroplasts and mitochondria, mitochondria doing cellular respiration, right? And so they're there to break down organic material to make as much ATP as possible. Well, chloroplasts are doing photosynthesis, which is using these components of, of water and uh, CO2 and light uh, in order to build as much uh, organic material as possible. Even though you could think of them as opposite reactions, they are structurally built very similar to each other because they're both going to be trying to overcome physical limitations like surface area, diffusion rates, concentration gradients, efficiencies, and things like that. So you should be able to compare looking at both the similarities and the differences between these two structures. So we could think of similarities like chloroplasts have an envelope where 
the mitochondria have an outer mitochondrial membrane. So there's a very similar structure, but slightly different vocabulary. The envelope is including both the outer and inner membrane, where the outer mitochondrial membrane, of course, is just the outer mitochondrial membrane, right? Then we have the thylakoid membrane, which is another layer of membrane on the inside. So it's a third layer of membrane inside the chloroplast, where for the mitochondria, it's the inner, membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane that is folded in order to create lots of surface area. So again, they're both using folds of a membrane. However, for chloroplast, it's the third one versus the mitochondria, it's the second one. They are both going to use those membranes, though, for similar processes, looking at things similar to the ETC, moving of electrons around through the membrane. Uh, they're both going to be used for the production of ATP, and they're both going to be using chemiosmosis concentration gradient of hydrogen ions in order to power ATP synthase. When we think about the folds, right, we have our stacks of uh, the membrane or our grania, and then we have the um, cyst uh, cystiae or cystiae, which is the folding of the inner membrane inside of the, um, the mitochondria. Again, even those slightly different structures, different vocabulary, both of them are there for increasing the surface area so that we have the most efficient rate for these reactions. Then we think about the space. We have the inner thylakoid space, or you have the inner membrane space for the mitochondria. Both of them, very, very low volume of space between the membranes in order to help maintain a very high concentration gradient between the hydrogen ions on the inside versus the hydrogen ions in the space around them so that we can have an efficient chemiosmosis. And then they both have these open spaces, stroma versus the matrix, and inside these open spaces, both of them have the uh, um, a chemical cycle. We have the Calvin cycle versus a Krebs cycle where reactants are coming in, products are going out, and they're constantly reproducing a part of that cycle to keep that cycle going. Obviously with the RUBP for the Calvin cycle, but for the Krebs cycle, uh, it's the uh, oxaloacetate. So there's a lot of very clear similarities, but some small differences between these two structures, and you should be able to uh, comment on them. So going back to this idea, you being able, you should be able to diagram both the mitochondria and the chloroplast. If you are asked to to talk about photosynthesis, you might be asked to diagram a chloroplast and talk about its structures and how they relate to its functions. You could be asked to talk about photosynthesis, and if you use a diagram, it might be a lot easier for you to explain your ideas if you annotate a diagram rather than just writing a paragraph or so about this information. Uh, then you should also be able to connect these different ideas. So you think about labeling things, right? You should also be always be able to identify different parts. Here we have our outer membrane, the inner membrane, thylakoid membranes, ribosomes, stroma is the open space, granule for granule for the stacks, right? Starch, and then of course, uh, oh, we also have a connecting between these membranes we call the lamella, but we don't that doesn't doesn't really come up. Regardless of the diagram, you should still be able to identify these key parts. Right? Or if it was an electromicrograph, you should still be able to identify these key parts. And additionally, because the chloroplasts and the mitochondria connect back to topic one, when we talk about the evolution of eukaryotes, you should be able to explain not only you know why um, uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts have DNA and ribosomes, but you should be able to explain like what's the point of them, what's the function of these DNA and these ribosomes. Ultimately, coming back to the idea that we have to produce proteins, very specific proteins, for photosynthesis or the mitochondria for cellular respiration, and so the DNA there codes for those proteins, and the ribosomes are there to then produce those proteins so that they can be used uh, either by the chloroplasts or the um, mitochondria. And again, one more time, just to emphasize, even if it is an electromicrograph, and more often than not, it will be an electromicrograph, not a diagram that you actually end up having to label, you should be able to identify the different structures. So you can pause, see if you can identify these, right? So you've got your grania, you've got your chloroplast envelope, the stroma, and then you've got your thylakoid membrane. Those are your basic structures that you must absolutely must be able to identify okay so uh, that's it for this content about photosynthesis in general and the structure of our chloroplasts now we're going to just finish up by talking about calvin and how he went through the process of discovering all of the different steps of the calvin cycle so Calvin basically discovered the Calvin cycle or crucial parts of the Calvin cycle, particularly looking at the different chemical uh, carbon molecules that form. And so in order to do this, he created what 
we uh, sometimes think of as the lollipop um, vesicle experiment. And so he took uh, cholera, the algae that we already talked about back in topic one, and he had it in this container with very, very thin um, glass, but a very large surface area. And in the inside this container, he was growing his algae. And so then he had a light source, right, moving through. And so he was able to uh, basically, you know, make sure that the algae had the ideal conditions for doing photosynthesis. And so to ensure this, he was making sure that there was lights, there was carbon dioxide being pushed through, and hydrogen carbonate, which would be there to help donate hydrogen ions. Um, and rather than going through the whole process of photolysis. Obviously, there was water present, um, but in order to make sure hydrogen ions were efficiently present, he used hydrogen carbonate as a source of hydrogen ions as well. So the thing is that early on in the experiment, while he was growing it, he was using carbon-12, which is the normal form of carbon. It's not radioactive. It's, it's the normal isotope of carbon. But then after a certain amount of time, he started to replace the carbon-12 with carbon-14. And you've probably heard of carbon-14 because it is the radioactive form of carbon, right? We do carbon-14 dating. We can figure out how old certain things are by looking at the amount of radioactive carbon that's still left over inside of them. So the thing is that a radioactive element can be detected using different techniques, particularly photography or other types of um, radioactive sensitive material. So by putting these radioactive isotopes into the experiment, he's then going to start producing chemical compounds, right, the um, RUBPs, the G3Ps, the TPs, that are going to have increasing amounts of radioactive material. So then Cycling in this carbon-14, uh, then he takes samples after certain amounts of times, uh, and then he can use that and use chromatography of the carbon-14 to identify um, uh, the size of the compounds, if they're a, a single carbon versus, you know, a six carbon molecule, because you would have more radioactive material in a, a compound that's made up of more of these radioactive carbons. So then if we look at his results here, this is um, looking at chromatography in a combination with radioactive detecting. So we have call it an audio radiogram. Uh, and so we can see different materials that he was able to identify. So here we've got PGA, we've got sugar phosphates, we've got dash sugar diphosphates, we've got TP, right? And so uh, if you look at it at different time points, he's got it as uh, this color, he's got five seconds versus 30 seconds. And so interpreting this data over these time intervals, we see that there is a lot more GP, right, or GPA, or which is another way of saying uh, glycerol 3 phosphate. There's so many different acronyms in biology. Anyway, uh, glycerol 3 phosphate or GPA, uh, PGA, sorry, in this image, uh, in the first five seconds, there's a ton of it, which is a really good indicator that, well, that must be the first thing that ends up being created in the Calvin cycle because this radioactive carbon that I've been putting in is all collecting into these molecules. Then after about 30 seconds, he sees that the range has shifted. And now we see that there is still a good amount of GPA, but there are also a lot of sugars, radioactive sugars are produced, a whole bunch of triose phosphate is produced, a whole bunch of different compounds, different types of acidic compounds are also being produced. And so that's indicating that from those G3 P molecules, these other larger complex molecules must ultimately be produced. So it's kind of giving him the first steps of the um, Calvin cycle of what do we do first with, with the formation of, of RUBP in this carbon uh, dioxide. Well, we must split it into two, creating the G3P, and then from there, there must be chemical reactions that allow various other compounds to be produced uh, in a relatively quick amount of time. So because of his discovery of basically the beginnings of the Calvin cycle and what are the first few steps in the Calvin cycle, uh, he uh, got some credit for it. And so we call it the Calvin cycle. The alternative vocabulary for it is to call it the Calvin cycle. And this is another example of how we can use radioactive materials and detect radiation uh, in experiments in biology in order to, to learn more about living things. Okay, that is it for uh, photosynthesis. If you have any questions about anything, uh, please let me know.